Hello everybody, what's poppin'? My name is Karim, I am a computer and science engineer uh, living in France, working in Paris. La Tour Eiffel, la baguette, comment ça va? Bonjour! <laughs> okay, so today I'm making this video about one of the hottest topics right now when talking about DevOps, microservices, and cloud architecture. Uh, we're talking about KS, aka Kubernetes. I'm going to give you the big picture. I'm going to explain you the architecture of Kubernetes, the main component of Kubernetes. We're going to start by um, creating a simple Spring Boot application. We we'll containerize it using Docker. Uh, once we're having our container, we're going to ship it to our Kubernetes cluster. So let's start. What does it even mean, Kubernetes? It's not an English word, it's a Greek one, uh, all Greek words. And the appellation, if we translate it to English, it means just pilot or governor. We're most often gonna see KAS. Why KAS? Because the first letter is K, the last letter is S, and between the first and the last there is eight letters. So just a computer science thing. We we'll always try and make it simple and stupid, simple and short. KAS. Okay, you got it. Another information to know is that Kubernetes was originally developed by Google. KIS, by definition, is an orchestrator. Kubernetes is all about one concept, the desire. Not any desire, but the desire state. And it's make sure all the time that it matches. So to ensure and guarantee the desire state, Kubernetes brings a lot of features. It is a self-healing system. So if there is an application that's going down on the cluster, it's the one responsible to make it up again. KIS automates all the rollback and the rollout operation. And it also make all the load balancing on the cluster. KS have also the ability to horizontally scale your application and just when needed. And that based on monitoring its resources like CPU and RAM. Long story short, Kubernetes have one goal, is to make your application resilient and scalable. So guys, let's take some real life utilization of Kubernetes so you can get the idea of when and why you should use Kubernetes. So let's take for example that we have a gift website a jewelry website maybe so guys finally our website is going online and we start having some visitors some clients we start having traffic going on but it doesn't remain static and that's because there is a day the 14th of february and the more we're approaching this day the more we're having people trying to buy some special gift for their lovers what's the problem easy the more we are approaching the valentine's day the more our website is going slow and if we do nothing it's just going to crash so what's the solution? We can go buy more RAM, more CPU and get it into our cluster and try to make the website work like the first day we launch it online. But for the situation, yes, it works because it's a predictable one. There are other situations we have no control, no clue why everybody is trying to go on our website. Nobody knows, you know, it's the internet, it's like that. All we should do is do the right configuration and Kubernetes will do the work, it will stick the application to desired state. Within the master node, we're gonna have four components, etcd, the scheduler, the control manager, and the API server. So etcd, it's the KAS database that stores all the information, all the cluster configuration. But just to know, uh, rollouts and backups will have a transaction to do with the etcd. For the scheduler, its main responsibility is to decide where to assign new object on the cluster, like pods. We're gonna talk about pods later. It's the one that decides in which worker node the pod should be assigned. CM stands for control manager. The CM has some tasks like controlling node and he's the one that knows when there is a node going down on the cluster. API server will intercept user command line or API calls, then validate and process them. So this is it for the first major part of the KAS architecture. So the second part, we will also have four main components for the worker node section, which are container runtime, kubelet, kube proxy, and other add-ons like DNS and dashboard. Kubelet and Kube Proxy are both agents that run in on each worker node. The Kubelet is the agent responsible to communicate with the control branch, with the master node, and he will make sure that our application is working correctly on our worker node. The Kube Proxy is a networking agent which is responsible of, of updating and maintaining all the networking rules on the nodes so that the pod can communicate with the internal world of the cluster or the external world. For the container runtime, it is an embedded software responsible of running container inside the pod. So just a quick info, uh, Docker was the container runtime by default used by KS until the last release of 2020 and then they switched it to Containerd. Guys, now that you have a big picture about what Kubernetes is, what is the architecture and what are the main components of the solution, let's dive in some practice. 
cool. So guys, first thing to do is to make sure that you already have a hypervisor on your machine. If not, I suggest to go check VirtualBox. Uh, just go to their website here, download the setup and install it first. Here I'm using macOS and to make the installation, I'm using Homebrew. It's a package manager. If you are using Windows, I suggest to go check Chocolaté. It's kind of the same solution, but for Windows. Okay, now we're going to use Homebrew to install Minikube. Let's get this command. Brew install Minikube. Now that the installation is done, let's go and install Cube Control, Cube CTL, or Cube Cuttle. So easy. Brew install Cube Cuttle. So if you don't know, Cube Control Cube CL is a CLI that we use to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. Next up is to create a Spring Boot application, and we need to containerize it using Docker. So guys, make sure that you have Docker installed in your machine already. If not, just go to their website here, try to download the setup and install it. I'm going to use Spring Initializer website, and I'm going to keep all the configuration by default. So. Maven project, Java, Spring Boot version 2.4.5, packaging jar, and the Java version will stick to the 11. As we're going to create a Spring Boot RESTful application, we're going to need one dependency, which is Spring Web. Go and name our application Lucky App and hit Generate. Then we'll unzip the package and open it within our IntelliJ. Let's go to our Lucky application class and we'll add REST controller annotation. Then we'll create a simple HTTP get endpoint, public string my lucky day, maybe it's our lucky day today. <laughs> and for the input name, we're gonna make it simple, am I lucky, random, random, I can you random. Return random dot next boolean. It's your lucky day. And if the boolean is false, oh no, try again harder with a smiley. That's it. I try to run the application just to check that everything is okay. So I'm going to local host eighty eighty slash am I lucky? It's not our lucky day, so try again, refresh the page. Ah, it's our lucky day. As you can see, nothing but a simple Spring Boot application. Now we're gonna need to containerize it using Docker. So first thing is to package it. We're gonna go to Maven install. Then we're gonna just go check under target. And here we see that we have our lucky app 001 snapshot.jar. Next step, we're going to create our Docker file. Docker file. So we're gonna keep it simple. From open GDK 11 GDK volume slash TMP copy target lucky app 001 snapshot dot jar to app dot jar then entry point Java jar slash app dot jar okay. And don't forget to prefix your image tag with your Docker Hub username. For me, it's gonna be Karim S. Wabni slash Lucky App. And we're gonna hit run. And that's it. Let's open Docker interface and verify that our image was created locally. Here we can see it. And now we're gonna push it to the remote repository. Push operation just finished. We can see that our image is now on the Roma repository and we can even go check that on the Docker Hub website. I'm gonna refresh and now we'll see that there is a third image which is Karim Iswabni Lucky App, which was created a minute ago. Perfect, we have it. So guys, it's time to launch our KS cluster, Minikube start. Minikube is running and now we're going to create our first pod. There's a different way to do so, but I'm going to show you the easiest one. kubectl create deployment lucky app image we call cream is for me slash lucky app and hit enter. Guys, do you see this? We're having our first KS object created on the cluster. Yes, it is a deployment, but don't worry, there is a pod created also. 
Okay, it's confusing a little bit. But before going further on this trial, I will explain you in detail the difference between a pod and a deployment. So with this graph, we're gonna see that we have different level of abstraction in KS when creating a pod. As you may know, the first building block of KS is the pod, as a p-pod. A KS pod can contain one or more containers, but most of the time it's gonna be one single container pod. From the bottom of this graph, we have our Spring Boot application, then the Docker container, and then we have our pod. On the top of this pod, we're gonna have a replica set and a deployment. But what's the difference? What's their role here? When we wanna create a pod, usually it starts by creating a deployment object. And as you can see, deployments are the highest level of abstraction and they manage pods via replica sets. Deployments here bring the possibility to make rollout and rollbacks. On the other hand, replica set will guarantee that the exact wanted replica of a pod are running. You should also know that replica set are just a building block and you will never have to manipulate them. You will think that creating a pod starts by creating a deployment. Okay, let's make it clear. This is not true. But you should know that you can create just a pod inside the cluster, but it's not the recommended way, except before doing some testing. And this for the same reason that pods should be monitored and scaled within the Kubernetes cluster. Creating a pod just by itself will not offer those mechanisms on the background. So let's get back to our command line and verify that the deployment created a pod and a replica set. Let's do kube control get pods. And yes, we see that we have Lucky app with a hash code created and drawn in on our cluster. Let's verify that the replica set is created as well. Keep control, get replica set. And yes. Okay, now let's describe our pod. We're gonna do cube CTL describe pod. Okay, that's too much information, <laughs> but let's talk about the essential one. As you can see guys, we have multiple sections that describe this pod with all the information about our image, our containers, like the first started date, volumes, if you're having persistent data, conditions, and events that will represent all the events that happened from the day we started our containers on the cluster. Okay, enough command lines for now, and let's check some dashboard. Minikube dashboard to start it. So simple. And that's open up Kubernetes dashboard on our localhost. Here we have some visualizations that shows the resource state created in our cluster. In the deployment section, we can see our Lucky App deployment that we created before using Cube Control. We have one replica created five minutes ago using the Lucky App image from my Docker Hub. Go and click on the tree vertical that, then click on Scale, so we can scale our application to have three replicas. So let's click on Scale again. And this will do the same operation as this command cube control scale and default deployment looking up replica equal tree. Okay, perfect. The orange color that we see here means that the deployment is making a change and it's communicating with the replica set to achieve the desired state. Yes, everything is green as grass right now. And that means that we're having three pod running our image lucky app in our cluster. First part was created five minutes ago and two new ones that have been running for a few seconds. On the left menu, let's go to the pod section, then let's click on the three vertical dots, then choose logs. Yes, those are our lucky application logs, which means that it's running inside the pod. Let's check the deployment section this time. Again, let's click on the three vertical dot, then choose edit, and here we have in our manifest. This represents the configuration file for our lucky app deployment, and Kubernetes can understand the JSON and the YAML format. The explanation of this YAML file is out of the scope, but let's just find our replicas property and change it from three to five this time. Let's hit update and this will execute the same command as kube control apply f followed by the name of the YAML file. Going back to the home screen, we can see that we have new pods coming in. Just a few seconds and we have in all our five pods running inside our cluster. Let's try something new this time. Let's create a new deployment, guys. So in order to do that, we're gonna click on the plus button at the top left. And here we can see that we have three choices. We can create from an input, from a file, or from a form. We're gonna try creating using a form, which is just a piece of cake. So the app name this time is nothing but an easy like app. The container image is my Docker hub ID slash the image tag, like a app. Number of parts, let's change it to two. And for service, keep it none. We're not using service right now. Click on deploy, going back to our home page, and guys, we can see that we have a new EasyLock app deployment, which created 
two new parts. This was a quick introduction to the Kubernetes dashboard and you can see guys that it was easy peasy, it's not rocket science. And last step guys is to create a new deployment through maybe not the easiest but the most used way. Yes, we are going back to our cube control and we're gonna create a deployment using an AML file. Okay, so let's clean up what we created in our cluster. Cube control, delete all deployments. And this is guys, is a cascade deletion, which means that we are removing every replica and every pod linked to those deployments. Keep control get pods. As you can see, we're having our seven pods with the status terminating, which means that they are being removed from our cluster. Okay, let's check again. Oh, that was fast. There is no pod left in our cluster. And let's verify if we're still having some deployment. Nada in our cluster. Perfect. How about replica set? Let's check that. Keep control get replica set. And the same guys, there is nothing left in our cluster. Everything is cleaned up. Cluster is spotless and ready. Let's create a new deployment using the most sophisticated way. Let's open this YAML file that you can find in the description section. And as you can see, nothing but a basic configuration for our deployment. Okay, at first glance, the YAML file looks complicated, but it's mostly boilerplate. This manifest file is a set of configurations, like the name of our deployments, the number of replicas that we wanted, some information about the containers, like the name of the image that it's running into. But I won't go into more details. I will stop here because I don't want to lose you. We will check this maybe in other tutorial, guys. So let's create our deployment. I would recommend using the apply command, which is useful for bot creation and update. You can use create if you want to. Okay, let's get our pods, keep control, get pods. And you can see that we're having two pods running, guys. Now, keep control, pod, get deployment. And as you can see, we are having our deployment running with two available pods from 25 seconds. Let's run the last command using Dutch or wide. Okay, guys, as you can see, we're having more information like the container name, the image that it's running inside, the selector. Okay, so let's try using the selector to find the pod within our cluster. Keep control get pods, selector app equals lucky app. And as you can see, we're having the two pods that we created just before. Let's check what's going inside our pods. Keep control logs with the name of our first pod. And as you can see, we're having our Spring Boot application running. Let's check for the second one, and it's the same case. Everything is perfectly working. How about now checking our application on the browser? So we're going to look at us to a I am lucky. This is not working because things are not that simple, guys. So you should know that pods are an ephemeral case component. They come and they go all the time. If one of our lucky app pods crash for some X reason, the deployment object will create a new one, which will get a new IP address. So how can we access our application from the browser? Since we are using Minikube, there is no load balancer integrated, unlike AWS or Google Cloud. Thus, we will need to run this command, Minikube tunnel. It will ask for your password. This tunnel will expose a load balancer service that we are creating immediately. Expose deployment, lucky app deployment, and we will name our service lucky app service from port A to port A80 and type load balancer. Yes, lucky app service is exposed. So let's type cube control get service. And as you can see, we're having lucky app service showed here of type load balancer with a cluster and an external IP. So this guys was the last step to make our application exposed so we can access it from the browser. So we're gonna copy the external API address. We're gonna go to our browser, we're gonna pass it, slash I am lucky, and bam, that's it guys. We are lucky today. So I will say congratulations if you made it to the end of the tutorial. Just keep in mind that Kubernetes will become so much a standard guys. And that's because it does the things that the very best system administrator would do. So guys, I hope that was clear enough for this tutorial. And if you have any question or recommendation, please feel free to let me know in the comment section. Thank you for watching. Go clean and catch you guys in the next one.